This is an informal talk, but I'm going to ask people to hold questions at the end because there's actually a reason why you all have this little, these two bits of technology at your, um, at your, at your tables. One is a pencil, which was certainly a revolutionary technology, communications technology, and um, a card made out of machine-made paper, another revolutionary technology. And we're going to be doing an exercise together, uh, two of them at the beginning and one at the end of the talk. And then the one at the end of the talk will lead into the question and answer period. So there will be um, plenty of time to talk. Um, the eminent historian Robert Darton <laughs> has said that um, there are basically four great information ages in human history. And I love that perspective on our moment. Um, when he talks about this, he talks about the first information age being the beginning of writing, right, around 4000 BC. Um, and you, will, you all remember that Socrates really didn't like that invention at all, right? Socrates thought writing was going to diminish attention. It was going to dull intellectual discourse. It was going to solidify ideas in a very kind of um, demeaned way instead of the fluid interactive ways that people talk together in, in dialogue form. Uh, the second information age, the invention of movable type with Gutenberg. The third, which is actually my, my original area of study, um, a, a, as well as um, Professor Darton's, which is um, the great age of steam-powered presses and machine-made paper and ink that made books available to middle-class and even working-class people for the first time in history. In America, that's happening around the same time as the Constitution. In fact, the very same printer in the very same month prints the preamble to the Constitution and the preamble to the first American novel, which is written almost as a call and response to the Constitution, um, but for in a very um, populist, populist way. Um, the fourth information age is now, the one we're living in, basically 15 years into the commercialization of the internet. And 15 years in the history of technology is usually the time at which we start thinking introspectively about what a massive change has meant and how we actually, not what will happen in the future, but how we've already changed. Um, I think 15 years is often a good time because it means that it, we're talking about kids who don't remember a before and don't really care about our nostalgia about before, right? If you're 15 years old now, you don't really remember a time before the internet. And you're not really saying, well, the internet makes our brains dull or any of that other stuff. You're saying about, tell me about what I can do now to make use of this technology in a productive way. And I think we're at that moment. And that's much, what much of this talk is going to be about today, how we can make institutional changes that serve the era we live in. Many of the institutions of school, many of the institutions of work, many of the things we wouldn't even know of as school and work were, in fact, created institutionalized, developed for the last information age, that e age of steam-powered presses um, and machine-made ink and paper that made it possible, and circulating libraries, all of which, that's another one of those institutions that makes these things possible uh, and makes re a wide readership um, possible in the 19th century. How do we think about institutional change for a digital age, a broadcast yourself age, an age where anyone can have an idea publish the idea, and it can be read by any, virtually anyone without the mediation of a central figure, without an editor, without a publisher. Right? That's a new moment. Um, and before I say any more, before I go into the talk itself, I would like um, you to use these older technologies of the pencil and the card. And I'm going to set my timer to two minutes. And I'd just like you to take two minutes to write down on the card Three things, if you, if you could change anything about higher education to make it responsive to the students coming into, into classes today and who are going to be working in this, this new world of work in the future, what, what three institutional changes might you make? There's no right or wrong answers. I'm just curious about what three things you do. I'm going to set the timer for two minutes. And um, just write down three things. Thank goodness. <laughs> you have no idea how scary it is to be up here in a silent room when you're, when you're the speaker. You know, to be, when you've been teaching your whole life, to be up here in that kind of silence is really um, <laughs> formidable. 
my heart is pounding. Okay, however, I'm going to set it again, and this time we're going to do something a little different. I want you to turn to somebody close to you, ideally someone you did not come in with, and look at the three things on each of your cards, and talk together and think about what one thing what might make the biggest difference in transforming education in this era. So just find somebody who's nearby. Some of you are, are scattered away, so you have to talk. And just share the cards. I'm going to set this again for two minutes. OK. Thank you. All right, two minutes is up. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. This talk is going to talk a little bit about attention. And you've already done like half of my work for me. Okay, so thank you. Can you think about the difference between the sound of the room in the first part of that exercise and in the second? Basically, the first part is the paradigm of education for the last um, uh, 120 years, and certainly the paradigm of, the, of a kind of testing that we do, which is a very, very odd thing. We tend to think of testing as, and I'll be talking about this a little later, testing is natural. But when you think about it, the time test right? That's the foundation of so much of our educational system. The time test is a pretty odd uh, phenomena in human history. But the difference between the energy level, I'm sure somebody came in here with the right kind of instrument. They could have felt the energy change, right? In the first experiment and the second. So the first thing I want to talk about is different modes of pedagogy. What we know, and there's been lots of research on that, is a year from now, you're far more likely to know what happened in the second half of that experiment, which was interactive, back to Socrates, right? Dialogical, than in the first half. Another thing we know um, is you're far more likely to remember that what you, t what you circled with somebody else as the most important thing, you're gonna probably remember it as an idea that you came up with, not the other guy, right? I mean, that's just, that's just sort of a funny way that memory works, where we're constantly, that's why we have historians, right? Because we, we're constantly, every moment, remembering our history and relative to who we are and what we are. Um, the, se the other point I want to make, though, is that cognitively, the second experiment you performed is the kind of thing that a lot of the rather shallow information about multitasking and how multitasking is damaging our brains and making us distracted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was a very multitasking thing you just did, right? You're coming up with some kind of idea, shared with somebody, in many cases who you've never met before, in a very noisy room with a lot of distraction going on, and you were able to focus on the task and perform the task. The reason that's important is we've suddenly, in a lot of the literature about attention, gotten this idea that our attention is extremely fragile and very, very easily distracted. Now, that's not untypical in the history of technology. When there's a new technology, we often use some version of distraction to describe what's happened. And for the simple reason that our patterns have changed and we're suddenly being made aware of, um, to use George Lakoff's phrase, we're becoming reflective about things that used to be reflexes. Habits suddenly appear to us um, not as habits, but as even impediments or things that aren't serving us because um, the need for those habits has changed, the uses of those habits has changed. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize by starting is, and it's part of the motivation for this book, um, when I was Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies at Duke, I helped to create a lot of programs with faculty, and one of them was the Center for Neuroscience, Cognitive Neuroscience. And because we were hiring a whole faculty and hiring directors, I was reading everybody's dossier. And in the best work on neuroscience, I was seeing this incredibly interesting thing happening where the work was about neuroplasticity and neural connections and how we learn attention and how excitable the world is. Things like the fact that 80% of the brain's energy is used in the brain talking to itself, not from external distraction, but from its own, own um, uh, habits and, and conversation. Um, in fact, if, if it was easy
for the brain to stay in a linear monotasking path when we weren't being distracted from external um, circumstances, the world would have a lot more Buddhas in it, right? Because we have a whole Eastern tradition that spent a lot of time um, thinking about very deeply what happens when you're in a meditative situation, no external distractions, all you need to accomplish is mindfulness. And it's very, very difficult, right? In fact, what we know, and especially the work from Brackley and uh, at St. Uh, Washington University in St. Louis and more common Fletcher in Cambridge, is that in fact tasks and multitasks are far easier on the brain than sustained and undivided attention. Um, I wanted to start with that just because we've had a lot of stuff, and again, the motivation for, for writing this book was a lot of stuff lately that's saying not only does multitasking distract us, but it damages our brain. I don't care if people tell me that multitasking makes us lonely, as some people are doing, that it makes us shallow, that it makes us distracted, because we can change all that. The idea that my child um, or that I am being, my brain is actually being damaged by multitasking, I think it's a pernicious and evil thing, because uh, you can't fix that. And it's a terrible thing, a terrible burden to put on a culture to believe that we're damaging our brains by doing something. I promise you, in that little multitasking exercise you just did, no one's brain was damaged in the course of that experiment. I promise. How about the little animals? Were they hurt? Pardon me? The little animals. Were they hurt? It's little animals. animals, yes. Uh, I may, may I don't know. Might have been. <laughs> um, one of the most famous experiments um, in multi in, uh, about attention was reenacted here at Harvard. It was first done in the 1970s when there wasn't digital photography and it was done very poorly and people just simply refused to believe what they were seeing. So in 1999, two very young psychologists, one was a, a beginning assistant professor here and one was a graduate student at Harvard, um, had digital cameras and video and they thought, well, we're gonna, re we're gonna reprise the old Nizer experiment. And this is, it's now become almost a cliche. How many people know what's, do you all know the gorilla experiment? Okay, for those who don't, I will um, explain what happened. It's, a, it's an experiment in attention blindness designed to trap us in our own attention blindness so that we see it, because the one thing we can't see is what we can't see. So in this experiment, the tester shows a video of um, six people passing basketballs back and forth. And as you see, half are in white and half are in black. Video is less than two minutes long. And you ask the audience to count how many times a basketball is passed between people in white. Video stops, and then you ask your audience who, saw, who counted 10 basketball tosses, who counted 13, who counted 14, who counted 15. And of course, if you counted 15, that's perfect. And you know, people raise their hand and are very proud that they counted the 15 tosses. And then the experimenter says, and who saw the gorilla? And this was an undergraduate student in Harvard, um, Dan Simons, Simon, Simons and Shabras did this, and Dan Simons tells me that it was an undergraduate at Harvard. They dressed her in a, in a gorilla suit and had her walk in between the basketball tossers, right in the middle of the basketball tossers. She's on camera for a full nine and a half seconds. That's a long time in camera time. She makes this face, she pounds her chest, and then she kind of saunters off camera again. Nearly 60 people who see the gorilla experiment for the first time when they haven't heard about it before. Do not see the gorilla. Okay. That's so ludicrous to believe that you could really um, not see the gorilla. But it's one of those great experiments that tricks you into realizing that it's your own brain that's been tricking you. In fact, many people believe that they were tricked and that the second video, when you re-show re the tape and the, and the gorilla's in it, they believe that someone must have substituted another tape. Um, Dan Simons likes to say that 60% of people don't see the gorilla the first time. 100% of people who have never seen the experiment are positive that if they saw it, they would have seen the gorilla. Um, you know, that, that attention blindness is also about our inability to see that we don't see the whole world, we only see a part of it. Um, there's some other hilarious experiments of attention blindness on um, YouTube that you can see. There's one by Richard Wiseman, who's a psychologist and amateur magician, called The Amazing Color Changing Card Trick. Have, have any of you seen this one? Okay. It uses one of the oldest you know, uh, wedding magician tricks in the book. You know, select a card from the deck, show it to the audience, don't show me put it back in the deck, look, I can find your card, right? You've all seen some version of that. The way it works is attention blindness. 
while you're looking at the, at the subject showing around the card, the magician changes the deck so that he has a blue deck instead of a red deck. So when the card gets put back in, he can pick it out because the cards are all different. The, the, back end, the back side of the cards have all been changed. People don't recognize that. In the Wiseman video, the camera pulls back after he tells you the trick. He gives away the magic trick. The camera pulls back. And you see that in the course of a very short video, it's maybe four minutes long, he's had this crew that are doing all these ridiculous things. He and the woman that he's working with take off their shirts, so they're wearing totally different colored shirts. Somebody else takes down the background, so the background changes. Somebody else takes out the tablecloth, so that suddenly there's a, a red tablecloth instead of a white one. Most people, far more than in the gorilla ex uh, experiment, don't see the color changes that are happening. Um, and just as most of us don't know the secret to the, to the wedding trick of the card. There's a third one that's the scariest of all. There are many of these. I've, I've probably taken 30 of these attention blindness tests. Um, the, the scariest one is the one that's used to train, and there are many variations, to train airplane pilots. Yeah, you can guess where this is going. Um, in the one that I've, uh, that I've participated in, the pilot is required to land a plane in extremely challenging atmospheric conditions. Velocity, wind, for all kinds of conditions. And then the video is shown, and the pilot sees. And in this case, it can be as many as 70% of pilots actually land their plane on top of another very large airplane that's, that's parked crossways on the runway. Uh, they simply do not see it because they're so relieved at having navigated all of these, these obstacles before, they don't see that moment when they're, whew, I can land now. It's all, everything's taken care of. They don't see the airline, uh, the, other, the other aircraft parked on the runway, which needless to say is a very good thing to learn um, in a flight simulator. Um, the first time I saw the gorilla experiment was at an event that my office put on it at Duke University when I was vice provost. And um, it was an, uh, an event for distinguished professors, and it was an interdisciplinary event, and someone showed the gorilla experiment, and I saw the gorilla. I saw the gorilla not because I'm good at this, because I'm not. I, I fail all the other tests, but that day, my office was in charge of the event, so I had like one eye on the caterers and seeing who was coming in, making sure everyone was seated in the right place the way you are when it's your event, and I'm dyslexic. So I looked at this tape, and it's pretty grainy and unpleasant. I thought, there's no way I'm going to do it, and I've got more important things to do. So I didn't pay attention. And that is the very annoying fact um, of how the brain is structured and that causes attention blindness. When we're not paying attention, we see different things than we do when we're paying attention. So the first, I've got two institutional um, lessons I want to um, draw from the gorilla experiment. First, as weird as it is to find out that you missed the gorilla, it's far weirder to be in a room with your colleagues. And distinguished professors, we were all going to count it right, right? I would say the, the, the number of people who did not see the gorilla, the people who did not see the gorilla was probably 90%, which is a, a number that's been replicated in other situations as well. Um, it's very odd to be sitting there in a room with your colleagues and realize that you're seeing a gorilla and they're not, right? I mean, that's kind of... It's pretty, pretty strange. Um, institutional lesson number one, if there's somebody in the room who sees a gorilla, even if 90% of the people in the room don't, don't discount what they see. Um, that, I would say, is one of the biggest um, lessons of attention blindness for business, but also for learning. That it's very, very easy to discount the, minor the minority opinion and to assume that the person who sees something that the rest of us smarty pants n don't see at all, that they're somehow seeing something that doesn't exist. It's important to count basketballs. It's important to see the gorilla. It's almost impossible to do both at the same time. But to discount the, what one person is seeing when you're all paying attention in a different direction is to miss a valuable opportunity. So one of the things that my organization, uh, the organization I helped to create, Haystack, does is we've created a method called collaboration by difference, which says that if you work with the right partners, 
And this is also, this is borrowed from the lessons of the World Wide Web. If you work with the right partners, in the right situations, with the right tools, and with a method that privileges the oddball opinion, you have a chance of counting those basketballs and seeing the gorilla. If you don't actually construct a method for doing it, you never will, because you will always be convinced that you're seeing everything there is to see. That's the kind of fundamental lesson of attention blindness. If you're a web developer, um, any web people here? Is there any web? Okay. One of the most famous essays on o the open web is The Cathedral in the ba Bazaar by Eric Raymond. And the dicta of that is a fun, one of these kind of geeky things, which is with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Definitely a mixed metaphor. English teacher ear is ringing here. Um, what that means is when you're doing web development, if you have everybody working from the same point of view and everyone agreeing on the same end, you're going to have faulty code. There's going to be bugs in your code. If you keep the situation of development, collaborative development, as open as possible, so there is many, many eyeballs, that's, and in many different eyeballs as possible, and they're not regulated, you have an excellent chance of actually catching each other's mistakes and making, uh, making the web happen, make the, making the World Wide Web happen. That was probably the principle uh, the most important principle that Tim Berners-Lee used in creating uh, the world, in addition to writing HTML code, to actually, well, and actually in contributing to HTML code to creating the World Wide Web, was having as many diverse points of view on the code as possible in order to co-create uh, the World Wide Web. It's how Wikipedia um, is created as well, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. One of the things about attention that's important is it's not innate. We know that infants do not discriminate. Newborn babies pay attention to everything. It could be a fan blade, it could be a shadow, it can be anything. And part of what learning is from birth on, well, actually, well, from birth on, is learning what in your world it's worth paying attention to. Um, there have been some phenomenal, really, really interesting infant um, neonatal work being done on what infants actually learn. And some of my favorite uh, in the last two years um, has been the German and French baby experiments, where it turns out that the birth cry as babies are being born is either a German or a French birth cry. And you can, you can train your ear. Uh, and so people can say, oh, that be, you know, without seeing who's being born, just hearing recordings, that must be a French baby, that must be a German baby. It's because you can hear from the sixth month of gestation. And already in the womb, babies are hearing the cries of their culture and learning how to cry um, in the accent of those around them. That's a pretty amazing, um, amazing finding. Uh, and it couldn't, it, it's like bird calls, like the science of bird calls has just grown exponentially in the last little while because of um, digital recordings. These are not things that human ears are trained to hear, but when you do them it, it, and you crunch all the data, you can actually see the variations. And then once you see, it's attention blindness, it's scientific research. Once you see the variations, you can then tell people what to listen for and actually train them to listen in a certain way. We now know, for example, that, there's, that bird calls have semantics and grammar and vocabularies in a way we never believed before for, for, through the, precisely the same kinds of research methods. Um, we also know, we used to believe that you got more neurons as you grew up, the same way you got taller or weighed more in the world, that you somehow gained more neurons. We, the best neuroscience now says that, in fact, adults have about 40% less neural connections than infants do. And that, and this is why it's, this is important to the idea of multitasking. One of the things we do as we learn is we make certain very efficient neural pathways and we don't make other neural pathways. Uh, one of my favorite uh, infant experiments about that is with Japanese babies. Japanese babies can tell the difference between R and L. By about sixth or seventh month, they cannot tell the difference between R and L anymore because there's no R and L distinction in Japanese. If a Japanese adult wants to learn English, where the R and L distinction is crucial, we use R and L a lot in English, 
um, they have to retrain their ear to hear something that at birth they were able to hear. Basically, all learning works that way. With certain kinds of efficiencies that are schooled um, to the cultural norms of our time. Um, I'm not going to talk about this today, but in other talks that I've given, um, the new work on how quickly we learn gender and racial roles is pretty amazing. And the iPad's been very efficient in this because the iPad is an inf uh, interface that very, very, very young children can use, prelingual children can use them. And they've done experiments where they'll basically say, who's the daddy in this? And they'll show white, ba white adults, black adults, different classes, male, female, uh, well-dressed, not well-dressed, and tiny kids who can't yet speak can arrange the figures on this iPad in ways that is a shocking, shocking redaction of the racism and gender assumptions and class assumptions of the society they happen to be born into. Um, this is brand new research that's being done in the last six months, but it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. One of the things um, that I'm interested in is how school reinforces a certain kind of attention how we school attention for the industrial work, workplace. Uh, the media theorist Clay Shirky says, institutions tend to preserve the problem they were designed to solve. Yeah. Institutions tend to preserve the problems they were designed to solve. What I'm arguing, and what I argue in, in um, Now You See It, is that many of the institutions we think of as school were actually revisions to the medieval, um, especially higher education, revisions to the medieval academy that made school much more pertinent to the industrial age. And the problem that, that, that our institutions are solving is how to pay attention in the industrial age. Some of the problems that, the, that industrial age ed education are designed to solve are the problem of how you keep focused attention, timeliness, uh, standards and standardization, hierarchy, specialization, metrics, and the two cultures, arts and humanities and the social sciences on one hand and the sciences on the other. The symbol of compulsory education, this is not higher education now, but public education of the 19th century is, of course, the school bell, right? Because you had to convince people that time was important, right? In a pre-industrial world, if you're a farmer, you don't care that it's 8.05. You care that the sun is up and you can do the work for the day and the work might be fixing a fence or shoeing a horse or sowing crops or weeding. You do what needs to be done. Part of what compulsory school was doing was saying, no, 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 that's not the right way of doing things. What we need is everybody in school at the same time, everyone sitting in a row, everyone um, doing the same kind of work at the same time by task um, and learning how to accomplish that task the way our first, ex first little exercise did in a timed way. Because, of course, that's the kind of workforce that's needed in the 19th century for the industrial workplace. Right? So school becomes the place of regulating time and space, task, discrete task, and attention to a very discrete task for a, a sustained time, far more than normal attention allows. Uh, most people say at three minutes we start to, our mind starts to wander. At five, we're pretty much gone, forget 20 minutes. Right? So that's kind of humbling to think about um, that the mind actually starts to wander from, its, from a single task um, that quickly. A typical school subject might be an hour. That's a lot to expect of a child. But that's what you're trying to do for the industrial workforce is school that kind of attention. The two people that are perhaps most important, or at least today the two people I want to just talk about um, who are most important for theorizing the work of attention in the 19th century are William James, the great founder of modern psychology, uh, and Frederick Winslow Taylor, the um, philosopher of the industrial workforce. Um, James whines in chapter 11 of Principle of Psychology that nobody else in English has bothered to write about attention. And in fact, when he's writing about attention in chapter 11, he does an interesting thing. He says, what he's interested in is attention and its opposite, and then this is a direct quote, what the French call distraction. 
the first, I mean, I've been reading James. I've, uh, James. I wrote a bachelor's thesis on James, and so I've been reading James for a long time. I was shocked when I was going back in the course of writing this book and seeing that. And of course, the word distraction has been in the English language for a long time. But in its modern usage of taking you off task, he had to go to the French for a French usage of a word in order to put it in his chapter on attention. I think that's very, very interesting. Decade after James, Frederick Winslow Taylor decides not to go to Harvard Law School, but in fact, instead to go into industrial work. And he starts as a laborer, much to the chagrin of his very, very well-educated and blue blood family uh, from Philadelphia. He decides to go um, into the factory because he thinks this is the future. And he becomes a manager of attention in the industrial workforce. And I, I, this is kind of an old story, but I just want to read a very quick little thing from Taylor's Time in Motion Studies. Quote, how long does it take a laborer with a wheelbarrow full of loose dirt to wheel it approximately 100 feet exactly 240 times in a 10-hour day? I mean, that's focused attention, right? He also believed in quotas for delivering that kind of work on time. And if you did it well and did it on, a quote, on quota, you were a soldier. And in the Q&A period, if you want, we can talk about mil militarism and 19th and 20th century attention. Um, and if you didn't make the quota, you were a malingerer or a loafer. So very punitive terms for not being able to carry out your task to quota on time. This is my only real content full um, PowerPoint and I just add to it whenever I come up with, come across an yet another sort of major innovation. Um, the compulsory public education goes from Massachusetts to Mississippi from 1852 to 1918. Most of the other things on that list um, are happening between a period of about 1890 and 1920. It's a lot of what we think of as school and work that are being developed at this time, including things, and again, this was new to me when I started doing this work, the whole idea of standard deviation, which has a very, very, very interesting um, uh, uh, etiology and, and, I mean, etymology in, um, neither of those is the right word I'm looking for. It has a very interesting history in um, eugenics. The father of standard deviation was also a eugenicist who believed that British upper class people should be paid to have children and poor people should be sterilized. And that's, that's a pretty interesting history as well. He's a cousin of Darwin's and a, a social Darwinist. My favorite thing in all of these is the item response test. Um, at one point, when I was writing this book, my editor said, well, you're really hard on multiple choice tests. Who invented the multiple choice test anyway? And I had to admit, I had no idea. It never even occurred to me that there was a person that invented the multiple choice test. There is. His name was Frederick J. Kelly. He um, invented the multiple choice test in 1914. He, um, a war was on. Men were in fighting in Europe. Women were in the factories. Immigrants were pouring into America at a, a, a remarkable rate. And laws had just been passed requiring two years of compulsory secondary schooling. Okay. Before that, high school was kind of college prep. Suddenly, there's a teacher shortage, a terrible teacher shortage. So Kelly, who's getting his um, PhD, um, at Kansas State Teachers College, now Emporium State, decides he's going to write a dissertation to solve this problem. And what he says is, if we can turn out Model Ts using standardized, mechanized, assembly line fashion, what can we do to get us through this crisis, this terrible teacher shortage now, in American, right now at this moment, that's like the Model T? And he invents the first item response test. If you've ever looked in on a child's end of grade test that's part of our national compulsory uh, No Child Left Behind uh, national policy passed in 2002, um, you will recognize a test. This is a, a quote from a Kelly test in his dissertation in 1914. Circle the animal from these four that is a farm animal, right? Dog, cow, crocodile, dinosaur. Uh, it goes on to say, fill in the whole circle, 
do this on time, everyone open your book at the same time, you must complete your task at the same time. It's tailored for the multiple choice test. And of course, there's two interesting things about that test. One, if you're a farm kid, why isn't a dog a farm, a farm animal, right? So part of what multiple choice testing is from the beginning intrinsically is how to think in a way that is about attention blindness, how to think in a way that passes the test, what we call teaching, teaching to the test, right? How not to think about logic, how not to think about ambiguity, how not to think about associations, but to think about what is the answer thereafter so I can get a higher score, so I can fill my quota in this test by filling in this bubble, right? The second thing is if you're a kid today, and I did this, and you Google farm animal, say like you were confused by that dog and that cow on your farm test, uh, on, your, on your multiple choice test, and you Google farm animal, you're gonna get 21,900,000 responses. Right? What about an A, B, C, D world prepares a child for a world where there are 21,900,000 responses to what is a farm animal? Even more, you can do this. If you go to farm animals and you see that Google will get you 21,900,000 farm uh, responses, the top one is a fabulous site done by educators. It's a marvelous, I spend time on it. It's a fabulous site called Farm Kids. Adorable. Only when you read deep into the guts of Farm Kids do you realize it's a product of Microsoft. You need to have the most recent Internet Explorer browser to use it. It does not play well with Apple. It says right in the fine print, this, if, you're using, if you're on an Apple computer, this isn't going to work, right? What about A, B, C, D, or none of the above teaches a child in this era how to cope with the avalanche of information and how to deal with this world where information that seems to be free, right? Information is free, is in fact proprietary, right? What I'm saying is that we've been training kids to a certain kind of attention for the industrial age. And in fact, our kids are dealing with all kinds of challenges that are very, very different from the ones that, that these tests and our whole educational system is geared to. Um, in writing, um, now you see it. One thing I did was I interviewed you know, the, found, the people who created the World Wide Web um, and people like Jimmy Wales who um, is the co-founder of Wikipedia. And I said to Jimmy Wales, is when you were, you know, in 2001, when before you'd even launched the first version of, of Wikipedia, did you have any idea that 90,000 people would contribute to the largest encyclopedia the world has ever known, 282 languages, for free, voluntarily, anonymously, you, know, you have to kind of go into the guts of Wikipedia to even find out who's editing what, and that other people would edit the work to make it better, and that the American Library Association would first wisely say you've got to be suspicious about this, and then, uh, with huge admiration I say this, because it's not very often that institutions, and especially those who are charged with um, accuracy and being reference librarians, would redo their own work. In, the, in recent years, the American Library Association studies have been saying that, in fact, Wikipedia is not any more or less um, accurate than print refereed encyclopedias, right? That's different than uh, certain, you know, specialized research. Um, but actually, when I was, again, when I was writing this book, I looked up calculus. I was a math geek my whole childhood, and I looked up calculus. Um, on Wikipedia, and I was shocked. And I thought, this is, a, this is corrupt. There's no way this can be true, right? We all know Newton and Leibniz created calculus, and it had all this stuff about Egypt, and China, and India, and, and the Arab world, and Arab, Arab mathematicians. And of course, we've all heard a little bit about the great um, um, Arab thinkers who contributed to mathematics. But this was a whole world of stuff that I had never heard before. So I called the head of reference librarians, uh, the reference library at, at Duke, and I said, this is wrong, right? This is made up. This is some kind of problem. And to her credit, she said, uh, let, me, let me get back to you. It took her a week, and she ended up talking to her equivalent, head of reference librarians in Egypt, in um, uh, Iran, in India, and in China. And she said, you know what, it's right. But there was no 
reference book in English that gave credit to those other sources, nor was there in Egyptian, uh, Farsi, you know, Mandarin, and the other sources. That's kind of amazing, right? And I think it goes again back to the idea of attention blindness and what we can think about as knowledge as attention blindness. What happens if we take that funny phrase from the creation of the open web with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, and apply it to all the ways we can make knowledge together? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a different kind of process. It's certainly not filling in the right answers to a bubble test. It's open-ended. It's hard to verify. I mean, it took her a week before she felt confident getting back to me. But it's also a world of knowledge that I would, I would say we did not even know existed even 20 years ago. And when I said to Jimmy Wales, did you know? He said, we had no idea. When you asked Tim Berners-Lee, did he know that they, they could make the World Wide Web? Remember, the World Wide Web doesn't have a boss, right? It has a consortium. Who ever heard of something as massive as the World Wide Web run by a consortium, right? Um, Berners-Lee said he had no idea. This code was being written. Um, there's a legend, I don't know if this is true or not, um, that there was this code being written by someone in Japan. And it turned out to be a 16-year-old high school dropout in Japan that was contributing to the code that became the World Wide Web. And that's, uh, again, by legend, Joey Ito, who's now head of Creative Commons and one of the major, major figures um, in uh, contemporary technology and contemporary thinking about technology. Um, Mozilla, right? Open source browser, uh, passionate about keeping the web free, uh, has claimed 30% of the world's browser usage. That's pretty amazing, right? A voluntary nonprofit going up against Microsoft and claiming 30% of the world's share of users of, of browsers. The Mozilla governance is so antithetical to uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, it's almost comical. The, if you go onto the Mozilla website uh, and click on governance, it says, quote, Mozilla is an open source project governed as a meritocracy. Our community is structured as a virtual organization where authority is distributed to both volunteer and employed, employed community members as they show their abilities through contributions to the project. Really? I mean, I think by most 20th century views of human nature, that's impossible. Right? Rational choice economic theory isn't that old, right? The idea that you're only motivated by self-interest, that you, you know, it, it, the idea that this could be done voluntarily for some greater good, kind of astonishing. And I don't think we've remotely plumbed what that could mean uh, for education um, in the century we're living in. Um, I want to open this to questions and answers very quickly. But before I do, I'd love you to just pick up your card and, and just shout out some of the things that you circled together about what kinds of institutional changes we could make um, if we were really taking seriously the world we've inherited or the world our kids are inheriting and tried to make an education for this moment, this historical moment. Any, any things that anyone wants to? Try? Yes, please. Absolutely, and there's no employer that doesn't say that. And especially, I don't know if in Fast Company this week, there was a wonderful interview with um, one of the architects of um, India's, um, uh, <laughs> uh, it, who says when, they, when Indian students come, South Asian students come to America, it's to learn this thing called critical thinking because it's so important to the Indian workforce. Critical thinking, great. Yes. Ah, self-designed curriculum for a self-designed world. Interesting. Okay. Other things. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Ooh. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Other ones. Yes.
Fantastic. You all heard like this, uh, that's a great one. Um, and I'm, I've been loosely involved with a project at Stanford this year where there's, we've, we're making an uh, artificial intelligence course, open source and online with feedback done by students, et cetera, et cetera. And we thought maybe 20,000 people, no, we actually, we didn't. We thought 20 people, maybe 100 people, maybe a, maybe 1,000 people would sign up. 100,000 people have signed up for this course, which is kind of, kind of crazy. But yes, by what that means to take our knowledge and make it public. Any other? Yes. Oh, ab free education, absolutely. This is a huge issue and one I'm, I think probably many of us share the, the erosion of what, what that means to have a, a public educational system eroded and too expensive for most people. Um, we know that the number Two reason people from lower incomes don't do well on standardized tests is maybe they don't have enough knowledge base, et cetera. The number one is it's really hard to focus on uh, uh, the kind of thinking, odd kind of thinking that you can game, the kind of thinking on a multiple choice test. And if you don't believe it's going to get you somewhere, you don't. So a lot of the t low test scores are more about attention than they are about knowledge, which I think is very interesting. Um, in writing, now you see it, I interviewed lots and lots of people who are already doing many of the things that you've already talked about and that you have on your card. Um, some of my favorites um, are somebody who's actually gotten a lot of attention since, since then, Thorkil Sone, who has a program called, a uh, company called Spe Specialistern. He was a software writer in Denmark who also had an autistic son and realized that in his company, he wasn't able to find software performance testers. It's something that only humans can do. It's not machine doable. Um, but that his son did it brilliantly. And he changed his company entirely and created a new company where he only employs autistic people as software performance testers. The problem is he has to hire go-betweens between the software performance testers and so-called NTs, which is the Audi word for neurotypicals, because the autistic people are so frustrated at how stupid the NTs are and how unable to pay attention they are and how they spend all their time out gossiping instead of doing their work, et cetera, et cetera. So they, you know, he has to have these trainers who say, it's okay, they still contribute to the company in other ways. I know they're inferior at software performance testing, but they really, they have their use. Don't just write them off. We really need them. It's okay. Um, Another person, at one point I thought, what's, what part of our world has not been transformed? Is there any part of our world that hasn't been transformed? And I thought building trades, right? Brick and mortar, how has that been trade, changed by the internet? I was trying to be my own devil's advocate about how big this change is. Is this really the fourth great information age in all human history? And so I'm, I'm deciding, okay, building trades. Then I'm driving along and on NPR, someone named Dennis Quaintance was being interviewed. He's a local builder in Greensboro, North Carolina, successful developer in Greensboro, North Carolina, a small southern city. And um, he talks about how he had twins when he was 40. And he has, and his wife were walking along the riverbank with their twins and wondering, when these kids grow up, are they going to be proud of us? And he said, you know, I'm affluent, I'm successful, I'm respected, I'm a good guy. Yeah, they're going to be proud. And his wife said, what about what we've contributed to the environment? And he was about to, to um, have a contract for a $30 million hotel in Greensboro. And he said, what if we tried to make a sustainable hotel? He called together the 60 people that had worked on all of his previous build, building projects. And he charged each of them. This is collaboration by difference. You who've done electricity before, find out about sustainable electric work. You find out about sustainable plumbing. I think he called it toilet of the week, because every week they'd bring in a new toilet to see how it worked. Was it efficient? Was it beautiful? Was it elegant? Did it save water? It was trial and error and doing a lot of collaborative work, learning through what other people had learned on the internet. The hotel's beautiful. I'm a design snob, and it's beautiful. It would be a hotel that would be beautiful by Cambridge standards, by New York standards, by Paris standards, by LA standards. It feels great. When you're in the Proximity Hotel, I've spent time there, you feel like you're at the beach, and you realize you've never breathed air like this before. 
But the big thing is when the LEED Association, L-E-E-D, came to see how sustainable it was, the Proximity Hotel got the only, the world's only platinum LEED designation for a hotel. 60 people learning how to be sustainable. So when I said to Dennis, well, what was the, what did, what was the learn message from all this? You know, what did you take away from this? He said, well, I took away a message that's both really happy and really sad. He said, the happy part is that we're 60 people. Most of us don't even have high school educations. We're from Greensboro, North Carolina. And we taught ourselves how to be sustainable because we believed in it. He also saved money. The project was 30 million and it came in at 31 million and he saved a million dollars on the HVAC within a year. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and on there were tax breaks as well. But uh, it's, and when the recession came, they're doing well because they've gotten all this attention as the world's only platinum lead hotel and people all are working because they're the only um, sustainable developer, uh, contractors in North Carolina. So they're doing great. He said, so that was the happy part. We learned. We taught ourselves, we worked together, we came up with this new method of working for a goal, and we got recognized for it, the world's only platinum lead hotel. That's the happy part. The sad part is, it wasn't that difficult. And of course, why that's sad is, if you can make a change that momentous, and it's not that difficult, why isn't everybody doing it? Right? If we have the means, if we have the tools, to change the way we do things. Why don't we? What is stopping us? And I'm convinced that a lot of what's stopping us is 100 years of schooling towards a certain kind of ideal and method and education for an industrial age. Why I wanted to start with those cards is I believe that we, it's not that difficult. And I think we all know, we have within our hands, literally, right? We have ideas about how we can change, and I actually don't believe it's that difficult. And that's where I'd like to end today. Thank you. Um, have you come across more, um, have you come across in your research ways of encouraging more collaborative learning initiatives, I guess, in classes that routinely use lectures and yes. aren't really conducive to that kind of learning? I gave, I guess. Do you have any uh, examples or anything? I'm now hearing because I got in so much trouble from my how to crowdsource grading blog, which is this whole um, collaborative way of learning and teaching and peer grading together and peer learning peer judgment together. Uh, but I now hear from people all over who are using different methods, including in large lecture classes. Um, the little card thing is one that I actually learned from somebody else and it's something she uses um, in her classes. And I now do that with just about all my classes where I have people write individually, then collectively, and then I sometimes mix it up in different ways. Um, I've organized 60 people, 60 students to do innovation challenges uh, where I will set a task and then they have to solve the task collaboratively, um, sometimes in a, a two hour period, sometimes in a two day period, but it's an actually some kind of project that they have to build together, do together. The one I just found recently, I gave a talk a couple weeks ago at the University of Southern California um, in their, I think it's called Cinematic Arts, the School of Cinematic Arts. And it's a school where they have filmmakers, people thinking, doing critical theory about media, um, script writers, uh, production people, very, very different. And they found that people weren't talking to each other. So they made an augmented reality game for their introductory class, which is about 200 students, where hidden in the lectures are clues that different teams of students each week have to manipulate in such a way. You might either get an email or you might get a text that says 437. And what you do in the lecture is you listen for 437 and there's some clue embe embedded in that and it tells you to do, go to a project. And then there's another clue that unfolds. So there's both the lecture that's happening, I mean these are cinematic students, so they're doing it in a very creative way. But when I gave my lecture, they had me read a little script in the middle of my talk that was a clue. And the only way you can solve the cr clue is by working across the different disciplines. They've arranged this, this event so that it's basically like, a, like a, a film crew coming together where everybody has to collaborate their different ta tasks in order to find it. And by the end of the term, they will have accretively 
made a collaborative video project of the whole class in addition to what they're learning in these sort of lecture, lecture classes. Now that's the most elaborate one I've heard and you can go I think online and find and for the School of Cinematic Arts and find out the details of that. But there's other ones. Um, Mike Wesh, do, do you know Mike Wesh is somebody who teaches at I'm gonna do a terrible thing here. It's either Kansas State or University of Kansas. Does anyone know? One of those. Kansas State, thank you. Mike does um, anthropologies of media where he involves the students in making a video of the course and it's very low tech. Pieces of paper with writing on it but students have to research it and then they produce something together. These videos get hits and I, I think probably they're up to Vision of Students Today, I think, has had over four million hits so far on YouTube. But they produce these collaborative works that they do on YouTube. So none of those, is, the things I'm describing aren't every day doing something collaborative, but ways to take the lecture class and make it more collaborative. Um, I've also taught with clickers. Um, my students a year and a half ago actually made something um, called the Feedbacker that was a sort of non-punitive back channel where they could, um, be asking each other questions as, my le as, as the lecture was going on and then um, contributing to the lecture. Um, I think you have one, I think Aram said, you said that, uh, Amarza, you said there was something here at um, uh, the Berkman, if we'd chosen to use it, where there's a back channel that's going on and people from the audience can be putting f things in a Twitter feed that are, or in a, some kind of a, a feed. It's a double feed? and then you can actually incorporate that into the lecture. So there are ways of doing that. I've also had people with Fiona, we've done things um, at big lectures at conferences where um, people have tweeted um, questions and Fiona's coll collected their questions and been asking them in the course of a panel discussion. Um, you know, so there are ways of getting the back channel to talk. Um, and there are sometimes pretty massive ways of doing it. Um, IBM has a proprietary system that does a pretty good job of having as many as 100 people who are able to talk together in a conference call and back channel at the same time and be able to do a kind of simultaneous conversation. Unfortunately, educational technology, I think, is way uh, behind. I'm great at surveillance, terrible at collaboration. And um, we're not quite there yet. But I'm hoping the students today will start inventing Better, better kinds of collaborative tools. And I bet in this audience there are people right here in this room, I'm sure there are people who already have found interesting ways. I have a question about collaboration. Um, I think, I, do you want to put this? Yes. Thank you. I have a question about collaboration. I assigned my class on Thursday to write a series of uh, lect collaborative lecture notes using Google Docs, but I assigned them to students who were created by a, an article that said the real world is like this and this and this. Right. Right. Yes, uh, lots, lots of thoughts. Um, one of my favorite places that I studied was a sixth grade class where um, it was called Creative Productions. And the point of this class was to take everything students learned in all of their other classes and find kind of real world uses for it. And this teacher who was 25, brand new teacher, um, had each student decide, do I want to do this alone? Do I want a collaborative team? And what kind of, t what kind of team do I want? And they actually, part of what they did as sixth graders was talked about their collaborations. And so if somebody wasn't contributing, they would come in in the beginning of the day and would write, like, you know, I want to talk today about how frustrated I am that all my team members aren't contributing. And his point was, in the real world, yeah, everything works on teams, and there's still people not carrying their weight, right? Um, anybody who's been in this room who's ever worked collaboratively knows that there's sometimes, if you're going to get the job done, it means... Yeah, teamwork, you're doing the work, right? You're doing it. Um, uh, when I, uh, just to finish that story, when I asked Duncan where he learned how to do this method, it turned out his dad is a consultant for Fortune 500 companies that are going through technological changes and the workforce is dislocated. And he was giving his sixth grader this collaboration sheet that his dad uses for executives at training session. They were doing it. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Interesting, interesting. Well, when I do, th thank you, that's a, that, I, I like your answer better. <laughs> that's very good. Um, 
When I teach, taught This Is Your Brain on the Internet three years ago, uh, I, I came up with a syllabus. Um, my students, two students would be in charge of the class each week. They would read the syllabus. What was assigned that week? They would decide whether they wanted to use that, augment it, or get rid of it and do something else. They would make assignments to the class then and, and read the assignments. And at the end of the class, I thought, oh, these students are going to think this is the most brilliant class they've ever taken. And, and they were very generous in their comments. But three of my students, including the only two A pluses I think I've ever given, got together and said, you know, what we don't like about this class is you've taught us so much about peer contribution, but your grading, just what you just said, your grading system is the conventional grading system. We think you need to change that. Yes. And you know, if you're a terrible teacher if you don't listen to your a, a critique. First of all, it's hard for students to write a signed critique. And for your a, if your A-plus students are saying there's a problem, there's a problem. So that's what made me go to the system where um, same assignment, uh, old-fashioned 60s contract grading, but to decide whether the assignments are satisfactory enough, the two students in charge have to give feedback and decide whether it's satisfactory. Then the next, two, next week, their students again, and two other students do it. So the class is really about collaboration and feedback and how we can learn from one another. That changed the dynamic entirely. That, that, was, that was definitely the most remarkable experience I've ever had as a teacher. It was, it was, it was truly mind-boggling. But seeing students understand what feedback is kind of amazing because we're very poor at that. We're really good at telling students what they're doing wrong, or, or, but we're not very good at telling them how you take and incorporate feedback into their learning. In fact, I kind of think shows like American Idol and So You Think You Can Dance and Project Runway and all of those reality shows where feedback is so crucial and you see somebody struggling and get feedback from the judges and it seems so harsh and then the next time they've incorporated it and they've gotten better, I kind of think that that's almost doing the job that as educators, we're not doing enough of teaching students in this era how to really give and receive tough feedback. When I teach that way, people always, cynics always say, oh, that's probably the easiest class they teach at Duke. Well, about a quarter of the stu no students ever think that, and about a quarter of the students drop out. And, but there's, since I'm the only one who teaches that way, there's always a long waiting list and another quarter come in. So it's a little self-selective. But it's, an, it's a formidable class. I usually have to calm the students down because they're working too hard. It's much, and there's lots of research on this. Much harder to impress peers than teachers. Right? If you're a student at Harvard or a student at Duke, you've got a lot of experience doing well for a teacher. Doing well for your peers is really tough, really tough. Yes? That's re it's really interesting. Um, gender is an issue that's uh, very, very interesting to me. Um, I'm also a real groupie of research design. I mean, I love reading in the guts of research design. And I haven't yet read articles on uh, research on gender collaboration that I'm convinced by. There's some interesting stuff on multitasking that's mostly about young children, how early on we take three and four year old girls and ask them to do multiple very responsible tasks at a much earlier age than we, in our society, than what we require boys to do. And there's some extra, I'm not sure about the extrapolations from it. That, that research is pretty solid. The extrapolation from it is that women do better at multitasking than men, because it's just expected in a different way. So there may be some carryover to collaboration too, but I haven't yet met one that, where the research design feels like it's uh, enough of a control to really convince me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic about research design because I, mean, I really do love great research for design. But, um, but it's, I think it's an area that people should be doing more research on. It would be really interesting. There's lots of cross-cultural work on collaboration, you know, where some cultures do it much better than others be, you know, because it's part of the culture. <laughs> it's one of those things you learn early on. Yes. Yeah, this is a bit of a generic question, but I um, just wanted to have your take on what do you think of um, the effect on of video games on attention? Because there's 
bit of two school of thoughts on that. Yeah, there's so many schools of thoughts on that. Um, you know, back in the 80s and before Columbine, before 1999, almost all the work was positive on video games. Uh, good for retention, good for memory, good for spatial configurations, good for th certain kinds of 3D modeling. And that research is, has gone into incredibly productive game mechanics that are being used for rehab, uh, especially of stroke victims, uh, for training of pilots, military training, uh, uh, robotic surgery training, all kinds of things that need um, uh, some kind of, actually, um, uh, they use really interesting game mechanics to teach people how to do better on multiple choice tests. The research that almost stopped in 1999, and I think it's partly Columbine, the horrible tragedy of Columbine, and uh, around the same time video games start getting more and more narrative and graphic and scary, first person shooter games instead of Pac-Man and you know the first generation games. The research really starts going towards how video games hurt us. So it's really only been, I think, in about the last two or three years, maybe five years, partly because of the Berkman Institute and Pew and MacArthur and other places that are really looking at how kids and young people actually use video games, that there's been, some, been research again saying, you know, it really doesn't destroy your brain. It, there are benefits here. But there was about a 10-year, uh, eight-year gap where the research almost entirely was for the elderly, handicapped, professional training, uh, sports training, military training, and we just lost work on video games during that time. Um, I think cross-culturally, historically, games, you know, that uh, in, the, in the purest form of a contest or a challenge where when you do well in the challenge, you don't get a timeout or a research, you get a harder challenge, is a fantastic way of learning, and I'm pretty interested. I don't like what's so-called called gamification, but I do like individual performance-based testing where the test is incorporated into the learning method mechanism. So you actually do some, like a, an algebra problem, and depending on how you do on the algebra problem, you're then another problem is generated that's either harder or less hard, and either a challenge or not challenge. I think those mechanics tend to work um, quite well. Um, uh, but it's, you know, we've, we have to catch up on research. I, th I don't think the research is, I think there's a lot of platitudes and a lot of prejudices and not necessarily as much research as, as we need to have on that. So I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm trying to be as precise as possible about that. For rehab and things, it's, it, it, we know that, it, it, you know that it's an extremely good motivator in boring tasks, right? You know, like people having to rehab, um, uh, learn to read again after they've had disabil debilitating strokes. It's, you know, it's terribly, terribly boring work and uh, game mechanics can really, video games can really help make that doable. And if, it, if you don't practice it, you don't, you don't recover. It's that simple. So some of that work is really impressive, especially work that's coming out of the Netherlands. It's really, really interesting on that. Push the button. Push the button. Um, thanks. Um, that might be a good sort of segue uh, to a question about medicine. And I don't know if unless you've talked about that much, but um, when I go to get some form of medical care, it, uh, often not any longer being able to see it, the doctor, the god of the dispensing <laughs> of care, but now relegated to the new rising category of physician's assistant, um, I find that I'm sitting with somebody who is spending, and this happens with doctors too, who's spending all his or her time looking at a computer screen mm -hmm. and not dealing with me at all. Mm -hmm. um, and um, interestingly, the, I, f I forget his name, but he has a popular um, bestseller out called Cutting for Stone, um, who had an op-ed piece in the New York Times about this very issue for doctors and patients and people dealing with in that environment where he was sort of saying, let's get back to contact, um, real, you know, touch uh, and interaction with the patient instead of with the computer screen. So I wonder if this inspires any thoughts. Sure. Um, I'm fascinated. I mean, 
Haystack, the organization I co-founded, is trying to take the lessons of open web developers and apply them to education. Uh, two years ago, I got this letter. I mean, it was a physical letter in an envelope from the head of the Mozilla Corporation saying, we've looked world over for organizations that are interested in learning, and we think you're it. And I thought, well, this is cheesy. Right? There was a post-it note on it, call me, Mark Sermon, and a phone number. I was like, yeah, oldest trick in the book. And I almost threw it out, and, and one of my Haystack team said, just call. So I called, and it's Mark Sermon. <laughs> and I said, this is real? He's like, yeah, well, we knew you were an English teacher, so we thought you'd want a real letter. <laughs> you know? And we thought putting a post-it note on him was clever. He didn't know it was cheesy. He thought that was really clever. It would get my attention. But I've been hanging out with the Mozilla Foundation people since then. They have more parties and more meetups and more face-to-face -face than anyone I've ever encountered. They're always looking for an excuse to have face-to-face. -face. And in fact, they say they do far more traveling to be together because they spend all their time online and they know how important the human is. The reason that's important is I think when, whenever we're techno-determinists in the sense of believing that technology makes us either smarter or dumber, we forget that these are tools that we need to use wisely. And I figure if you're head of the Mozilla Foundation, you kind of know about technology, but you also know about human spirit. In fact, any 11, Monday at 11 o'clock, anyone in the world can call Mark and talk to him on the phone. Um, there's a phone number on the website, and anyone can call and ask about anything, any Monday at 11 o'clock. So that, pardon me? Uh, it's East, he's in Toronto, so I think that's Eastern time. No, it's, it's absolutely, it's interesting. You'll, you have no idea what's going to happen. They post an agenda, but there's also an open call that anyone can do it. But the point is, the people who are making and keeping the web open know we're humans. Why would we give over our power to a machine? Why would, we, why would you, a doctor look at a computer screen? If I, if I want to look at a computer screen, I'm going to, you know, if my elbow's hurting, I'm going to go to myelbow.com and find out from myelbow.com what to do. If I'm going to a doctor, I want a doctor to pay attention to me. And it's odd. I mean, I think, you know, the, the internet is making us dumber. The internet is damaging our brains. Logic is also that we're powerless. No, we're not. I mean, I think the important point, and again, we're 15 years in, so we're right on time, is to take in the fact that we can use these tools in a way that serves us instead of the other way around. And we're at the right time to be doing that. I just wanted to add that um, this was one of the things that was, has always been distressing to me about the Obama administration uh, emphasis and Obama's emphasis on computerization of medical records and medical care, um, which seems to miss what it's already, you know, some of what it's already doing in, in, in some ways, in some of the ways in which it's been applied and, and, and is being used. And I like, no, please, no more computerization of medical care. Although I realize that, you know, medical records are another category, but um, anyway. Yeah, actually, I, I personally think that's helping to solve the human problem of lost medical records. You know, I, I would like there to actually be, to, when you can move around in our mobile society forever, our records move with us. I think that's different than person care, but I, I'm so with you about the staring at the computer screen instead of me. If I'm, actually, that's what I say about teaching. If I can be replaced by a computer screen, I should be. In other words, if there's no value added about us having this precious time together to talk and do something together, put it online, right? I want the experience of face-to-face -to, -face to be something that honors how rare it is in our busy lives to have face-to-face and that really takes that as a special moment. Um, and there are lots of, you know, football games. There are lots of crowd activities that are important to share with other people. But to, to honor that, the visceral bodily part of that kind of participation is, I think, part of understanding uh, the digital age. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question that sort of may veer into the, the, the issue of optimism and attention, because part of what I'm hearing in your discussion of the sclerosis of education, government, process, even in business, has to do with the sort of mixed need for creativity and advancement and preservation of the status quo and yes. we do things the way we've always done them. Right. Because if I talk myself out of a construction job by doing the work faster, I'm out of work sooner. So there are examples of foundations that want to spend down their capital, of bands that want to break up on a certain date to avoid becoming shelf stale. Can you talk about how the, the need for attention and longevity is 
at odds increasingly with this need for institutional knowledge and longevity? Oh. That's a, it's a, I, I, uh, there are many ways I can approach that, and I can think of many ways to approach that. I do think Clay Shirky's partly right, that institutions like to preserve the problem for which they were, tend to preserve the problems for which they were created, but I also think institutions have within them the forces of change, that there's something about, institutions are human. It's almost like what we were just talking about with the computer screen. You know, institutions are both intractable, and the more intractable we think they are, the more intractable they are. Uh, trying to f help people feel they're powerful enough to make an institutional change, it's, you know, it's often arduous to make an institutional change, but I think it's not only doable, but I also think there are moments where um, organizations feel they're being held back by not going through the changes that need to happen. And at that moment, being as informed as we can be to act and to see how we can make change is, ex is extremely important. Um, I mean, because I, I like to put myself out there doing these crazy educational experiments. I always get um, a certain amount of negative stuff. And people are like, wow, that's so scary. Why would you do that? It's because what people don't know is I'm also getting so much more excitement and people asking what's happening. And the 350,000 mostly students around the world who are coming to these Haystack Scholar Forums, student-run forums, uh, you know, there's something really astonishing about that. And, uh, but, but how we get over our fear at institutional change in order to make change happen is a, you know, that, that requires somebody with a different expertise than me. But I, I, I do think Dennis Quainton's, that's why I love that story so much. It really wasn't that hard. And, um, you know, that's, that's pretty inspiring. People always call me an optimist. I actually don't know that I'm an optimist. Well, maybe, yeah, I yeah. am. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, I. Um, do you have any hope for a, uh, a few portals that are going to be able to basically refer to good experiments about being an optimist, about mindfulness, about measuring these um, that are and have been happening in overlapping circles such as the Mind and Body Conference, which is yearly, uh, with the Dalai Lama there as a right, scientist, right. not as a, as you know, I knew you knew that. And there's another uh, one coming up, uh, I think it's at MIT the end of the month, and it's uh, basically future of information and health, and they're including starting right off with some of the things like music and the things that are not what you think of as uh, cognitive um, measurable, but they're measurable. They are measurable, uh, and they can show the resulting in, increase in whatever the task is, team building, whatever. There's, you have criteria that are measurable. They're doing that. So I'm asking about the portal, portals maybe through some more stable organization like the NIH, which is overlapping these disciplines and just saying, well, there's these seed projects. They didn't happen to get funded, but they had very good results. And this is the, this is the area with music therapy, or this is the area with um, teens and mindfulness uh, projects and or teens and mentoring like gangs, New York gang sure. people mentoring kids. Okay. And they're doing, they're, they're being the big brother. And there's measurable results in the socio, social improvement area. Right. I mean, there's, I'll give you my card afterwards, and if you feel free to email me, because there's hundreds of them. There's so much going on. And I can tell that I, I better cut this short. But please, um, please do write to me, and I'll be happy to pass on what I can, because there's lots and lots. And just thank you all for being such, so great. Thank you. Thank you.